welcome to this lecture on drug adherence, individual variation after patients have been administered drugs, presence of other drugs, drug tolerance and tachyphylaxis. I'm Dr. Akia Kiedi of the Department of Pharmacology, Therapeutics, Toxicology of the College of Medicine, University of Lagos. Now, we are considering first drug adherence versus compliance. These terms have been used interchangeably in the past, but the more modern trend is that adherence refers to patients' behaviors in terms of sticking to the physician's instructions as regards drug use. In other words, the trend now is to use drug adherence where drug compliance was used in the past. Drug adherence, for example, refers to whether a patient who was prescribed a drug PO per oral as actually taking it orally, or if the patient, for example, was asked to take a medication in a frequency pattern, that is, uh, maybe the patient is asked to take the drug eight hourly. Drug adherence refers to whether the patient has obeyed that instruction of taking the drug eight hourly or not. So drug adherence in that wise refers to whether the patient has obeyed the frequency of administration. So we use drug adherence for such situations now rather than talking about drug compliance. It was in the past that we spoke about drug compliance in this wise. However, many still talk about drug compliance when they intend drug adherence. There are some factors which prevent patients from adhering to instructions on drug administration. This include increased complexity and duration of therapies. For example, when the prescription becomes more complex, the tendency is for the patient to find it more difficult to adhere to instructions given by the prescriber. Multiple drug prescriptions also serve as a barrier. For example, a patient may have been prescribed multiple drugs for an illness, or the patient may present with multiple illnesses and therefore is on multiple drugs. And um, this Prescription of multiple drugs is common when patients have chronic diseases. And it makes it more difficult for the patients to understand instructions given, makes it more difficult for them to adhere to these instructions on how they should take their medication. So drug adherence becomes poor among such patients. Other factors that predispose to poor drug adherence include a multiplicity of frequency of dosing or dosing patterns that are awkward. For example, there are some drugs that have to be taken, maybe uh, 
starting off with smaller doses at the initial period of administration. And then you ask the patient to increase the dose with time, maybe over a number of days or weeks. Such a multiplicity of frequency of dosing or awkward dosing patterns sometimes uh, confuse patients and are associated with poor drug adherence. So dosing patterns should be as simple as possible whenever possible. When, uh, um, sorry, dosing patterns should be as simple as possible without negating the appropriateness of dosing because the dosing pattern needs to be appropriate. So for example, where you can ask the patient to take the drug eight hourly, you tell the patient to do so if the patient is to take it, the drug eight hourly, and you can even assist the patient with the timing, with dividing the days, the number of hours in a day into eight hours. For example, also where a drug has to be taken twice a day, you try to make it as simple as possible. Is the drug to be taken actually twice a day or is it to be taken 12 hours? Make it as simple as possible to the patient and explain to the patient. If the patient has to embark on a complex dosing pattern, then the patient should be supervised more. There should be more supervision. And then sometimes there may even be the necessity that a health worker administers the medication. Close monitoring is required for drugs that are to be taken for long durations because the tendency is that after some time, the patient may get tired and may skip some doses, may not adhere properly to the prescriber's instructions. Some drugs affect uh, the mental, the, so, so, some, some drugs may actually induce confusion and then some patients have altered uh, mental states. Now, this can cause poor drug adherence. So patients in such categories require assistance for drug administration. It is known that side effects may influence drug adherence, but this may not be easily predictable. Why? Because some patients may tolerate some side effects, for example, better than others. So the ones that don't tolerate it more, the, the, the patients that, that don't tolerate side effects well, may actually end up adhering to prescriptions poorly. But the ones that tolerate it well may have better adherence because the side effects will not deter them from taking the drug as prescribed. What is found is that sometimes the side effects may make the patient skip some doses. So if a patient tolerates the side effects better than others, that patient is not likely to skip some doses compared to the one that cannot tolerate the side effects at all. 
Now, some positive factors can also reinforce adherence to the drug prescribed. And so, such factors may actually play a role such that what is expected in terms of poor adherence because of side effects may now have uh, may now be underplayed so the positive factors or the belief of the patient about the drug that is positive may now override the side effect while the side effect may will usually cause poor adherence but the positive factors patients belief which is positive when this overrides the side effects then they will promote adherence and so the adherence ad adherence pattern of such patients may actually not uh, be poor eventually cost can be a hindrance to drug adherence especially when patients pay from pockets like it occurs in developing nations like Nigeria or like nations where the insurance uh, pays for uh, med pays the medical bills now it's been found that some patients may skip some doses of their drugs in countries like Nigeria, which I said are developing, because they just cannot afford it. They are buying the drugs from their pockets. You know, they are paying cash for it. They are broke. At the time when they are broke, they just keep the doses. And the tendency is that such patients, you know, by the, when they are getting close to the next clinic appointment, they now try to buy the drug by all means, start taking the drug a few days before they come to the clinic. Now to minimize the cost of drugs, the impact of the cost of drugs on patients, some steps can be, some steps can be taken. This includes uh, the prescriber Prescribing more of generics. Sometimes the generics, uh, when the prescriber prescribes the generics, it means the patient is not compelled to, to buy a particular brand. And so the patient has the option of buying cheaper brands. Uh, the prescription of alternative formulations, different formulations, the use of a drug under an investigating program offered by a company or charity, you know, may also reduce the cost of drug purchase because such drugs are usually cheaper than other drugs. Now we go on to uh, the other aspects. We are looking at the sensitivity uh, of the receptors to drugs, to agonists. A drug that, that binds to a receptor and stimulates that receptor is uh, defined as an agonist as opposed to a drug that binds to a receptor and does not stimulate it, which we usually term an antagonist. You've done receptor binding of drugs before. So uh, sometimes when patients start to receive uh, drug treatment for drugs that bind to receptors, that is at the beginning of drug therapy. What happens is that the drugs will bind to receptors, to its receptors more easily. 
and then it stimulates the receptor more efficiently to the extent that the efficacy and duration of action of the drug will be optimal. Sometimes it is even increased beyond what is usually the standard. And we term that as supersensitivity. That is the receptor is supersensitive at that point in time. Usually, like I said, this occurs at the beginning of drug therapy for drugs that bind to receptors. Let's take the example of a patient on antihypertensive drug, which binds to a receptor, such as uh, the alpha methyl uh, dopa, which binds to and stimulates the presynaptic receptors, the central receptors. It is possible that at the commencement of therapy, it binds easily to those receptors and stimulates it very easily and maximally. And what will happen is that the efficacy will be so high in some patients and the effect of the antihypertensive drug, alpha methyl dopa in that case, will be so much that there will be unusual fall in blood pressure. Such a patient will have so much drop in blood pressure and it will occur so rapidly that there will be requirement of either reducing the dose or even cessation of the therapy for a short while. The therapy may need to be stopped. Now, it has also been discovered that in such a case, after some time, the receptors may become fatigued. The signaling pathway may become fatigued to the extent that the initial efficacy got is reduced. And with time, the um, response starts to diminish. The response starts to diminish with time. Uh, we term that tachyphylaxis. We can also term it refractoriness. We can term it desensitization. These are alternative words which describe a state in which sensitivity to an agonist diminishes after repeated stimulation of its receptor. You know, it's a kind of fatigue, like I said, which occurs at the receptor. Sometimes that fatigue may occur along the signaling pathway. Uh, just like someone carrying a bucket of water from one point to the other, and after some time, initially, when the person starts off, the person can carry it easily, is so efficient at it, with time, the muscles get fatigued, and the person starts to drop back become slow at it. And that's the kind of thing we are explaining uh, because the receptors are stimulated continuously in the case we were discussing uh, before I cited the example of someone carrying the bucket of water. The receptors, the stimulation of the receptors continue to the extent that fatigue occurs at the receptor or along the signaling pathway. I'm not going through that again during this lecture because there's another lecture which precedes this, which explains drug binding to receptors, which explains the signaling pathways and so on and so forth. Uh, so efficacy drops and duration of action 
reduces with the onset of tachyphylaxis, refractoriness, or desensitization. Hence, more of such a drug or agonist is needed to produce the same effect got before tachyphylaxis sets in. So there will be a requirement for more drug concentration at the receptor site. So the dose will have to go up, will have to be increased to still have the same uh, therapeutic outcome. Usually, if the drug or agonist is withdrawn, then tachyphylaxis is reversed. So that when the drug is reintroduced at a later time, sensitivity is restored again. A patient who experiences desensitization will require an unusual increase in dose, like I said before. Now, we want to look at some factors that may actually alter an individual's response to drug therapy and then tie everything we've done together. Genetic factors is one of the factors we are going to consider today. There are some patients that have varied drug metabolizing enzymes. Again, we've done pharmacokinetics, so you understand what I mean by drug metabolizing enzymes. So some patients, because of genetic variation, may have uh, varied drug metabolizing, uh, varied drug metabolizing enzymes. The type of metabolizing enzymes they have may be varied from what is found in the general population. Some patients have carrier protein types or receptor types which are varied from what is found in other patients in the general population. In any of these cases, pharmacokinetic or pharmacodynamic activities may vary. Uh, hence, treatment outcome is different compared to the general population. When the drug metabolizing enzyme type a person has varies from what is found in the general population, or the carrier protein types vary, then those are pharmaco kinetic properties that are varied genetically. While if it is the receptor types that are varied, then we are talking about pharmacodynamic activities you know, that, have been, that are varied in such a patient. Such genetic variation may affect up to 1% of the population and is termed genetic polymorphism. But when it affects less than 1% of the population, then we just term it rare inborn error. Rare inborn error. An individual, for example, may possess such genetic variation in the enzyme metabolizing a particular drug to the extent that the rate of metabolism of the drug may be very rapid and drug effect is therefore not achieved because the drug is cleared from the system before significant concentration is achieved. I will explain that. There are some individuals in the um, population that may have drug metabolizing enzymes that are very genetically from those possessed by the general population. Now, in some cases, what happens is that the drug metabolizing enzyme works at a very rapid rate. It, it, it metabolizes drugs at a very rapid rate. And since it does that, it means that drug will be cleared from the system very rapidly. So that 
the drug concentration does not build up as expected. And if the drug concentration is not built up as expected, it means drug efficacy will either be low or there may not even be significant drug effects at all. The, 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 the drug may not exert the desired therapeutic effect at all, or it will ex exert it at very low levels. Uh, again, we look at uh, any drug, let's say a drug for treating diabetes mellitus, which is supposed to lower the blood glucose level. Because the drug is metabolized very rapidly and clear from the system, for example, then it's not as effective as expected. The efficacy is low. And so the uh, blood glucose control is very low. Instead of the blood, fasting blood sugar, for example, to be maybe about uh, 100 milligrams per deal, you may have it being much higher because the drug is clear from the system and it's not so effective. If the, gener if, if the genetic variation is such that the rate of metabolism of the drug is decreased, that is, the drug metabolizing enzyme is genetically varied to the extent that it functions very slowly, then it means the drug it is supposed to clear will not be cleared sufficiently, will not be cleared rapidly enough from the system. And so the drug will pile up. It will pile up in the system. It will pile up in the system. And when, when it piles up in the system, it can pile up to the extent of reaching toxic concentrations and drug toxicity may occur. Now let's look at tolerance. Uh, though we've talked about it before now, somehow, but let's, let's look at it more closely. Now tolerance to a drug action may develop because the effect obtained from a particular dose of a drug is less than what is expected. You say the patient is exhibiting tolerance to the drug. That is, you administer the drug, you expect an effect, but you don't obtain as much effect as expected. For example, uh, a drug is supposed to sedate a patient. And the patient is administered that drug, let's say 20 milligrams of the drug. And the, the, the patient does not fall asleep. We expect the patient to fall asleep. Does not fall asleep. Now, we say the patient is tolerant to the drug. So the patient will require a larger dose than usual. The patient will require a larger dose than usual. Or uh, salbutamol, for example, that is supposed to bind to um, beta adrenergic receptor and is useful in asthmatic patients because it will cause bronchodilatation. A patient is administered four milligrams, for example, eight hourly. But the patient is tolerant to it, and bronchodilatation is not obtained sufficiently. The patient still starts to wheeze. The asthmatic patient you know, continues to elaborate uh, evidence of uh broker constriction you know of the asthmatic attack those receptors are tolerant to the drug the patient therefore is discovered to need more 
of the drug, more of the drug. Let's assume the patient was even taking, was administered four milligrams, 12 hourly, you know, twice a day. The patient now requires the medication to be given uh, eight hourly, you know, or six hourly, or a larger dose in any way can be in terms of frequency, in terms of the actual amount of a particular dose. We say there's tolerance to the drug. And tolerance can be uh, pharmacodynamic in type or pharmacokinetic, though usually it is pharmacodynamic in terms of the type of tolerance. It's usually we find that pharmaco, we find pharmacodynamic type of tolerance, though pharmacokinetic can occur. What do we mean by pharmacodynamic tolerance? It is due to changes in the number of drug receptors, affinity of the drug to the drug receptors, or the function of the drug receptors. What I've said is that pharmacodynamic tolerance involves a change in number of receptors, affinity or function of receptors. For example, if the affinity to the receptor is poor, then we have less effect. If the receptors function at a lesser uh, level, then we have less effect of the drug. And so there is tolerance. What is the 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 uh, drug effect got is less than what is desired. Pharmacokinetic tolerance is commonly due to induced synthesis of drug metabolizing enzymes. For example, the drug, metaboliz the drug metabolizing enzymes are induced and they are produced at a higher rate what will happen is that the drug will be metabolized faster and cleared from the system faster. So the usual drug dosage will not produce the desired therapeutic outcome. And so the patient will require a larger dose of the drug or may require something, a, a system or a drug that will counter the induction of the metabolizing enzyme. Another cause of pharmacokinetic tolerance is seen in the function of P glycoproteins. These P glycoproteins are present in various parts of the body. For example, in the cells of the intestine, in the cells of the blood-brain barrier. Now, what they do, the pig glycoprotein, is that they pump out of the cells some drugs, so that those drugs are not, those drugs, even though absorption is on, but they won't accumulate in compartments where they are needed to function. And so the effect of the drugs will be less than expected. So if the drug is expected to uh, function in the brain, for example, or to exert its effect by being in the, by concentrating in the systemic circulation, since the drug is being pumped out by the P glycoprotein from this compartment, for example, an orally administered drug may be pumped back into the intestinal lumen by the P glycoprotein in the cells of the intestine so that the drug does not accumulate in the systemic circulation. And so there's tolerance to the drug because the effect of the drug is less than uh, expected. So we wrap it up now. Uh, 
we talked about drug tolerance and what is happening in that case is that or what happens in that case is that the effect got from the drug dosage is not as much as what is desired as much as what is expected and this can be due to pharmacodynamic aberrations or pharmacokinetic aberrations uh, if we relate this to desensitization we will understand that desensitization at the receptor site for example will manifest as tolerance to a medication and so that's the relationship between uh, drug tolerance desensitization otherwise called refractoriness by um, in some instances we are talking about virtually the same thing all these systems are interrelated so in summary we have looked at drug adherence and we've said drug adherence relates to a patient's behavior as regards obeying instructions given during drug prescription when the patient is now administering the drug we expect the patient to adhere to instructions and that this is a better term and a more modern term compared to compliance we don't use compliance for uh, this phenomenon again um we've looked at um, how receptors we've looked at this is receptor desensitization we've looked at tolerance and we try to um, link them one to the other thank you for being a part of this lecture